So I get this phone call, July 30th, 2005, from Steven Spielberg. He calls me up in his jovial self, and he says, Michael, I want you to direct this movie called Transformers. I'm like, okay, Steven, well, that sounds great. Um, let me think about it, and I'll get back to you. I hung up the phone, and in 30 seconds, everything that goes through your brain. Is that that little robot toy movie? Is that like a small soldier movie? That was just Steven Spielberg calling me up. Oh, my God. This is one of my idols wants me to direct a movie that he wants to be involved in. So I thought about it. I called Adam Goodman, president of the studio at DreamWorks. I said, Adam, so what is this Transformer movie? He goes, well, you should think about it. Adam convinced me to go to Transformer School, which is in Hasbro in Rhode Island. And I'm like, okay, well, let's make the trek. So the next morning, we went into Hasbro. You pass this hallway of, of all the famous toys we all grew up with. And I sat in this big conference room. I mean, they must have had 25 people in there, all trying to convince me to do Transformers. And they started with Transformer School, which is, you know, they basically take you through the entire lore of Transformers. Now, I've been offered a lot of comic book superhero movies in my uh, short film career, and I've always said no because it really hasn't appealed to me. But one thing I did spark to recently was Japanese anime movies. I just love their visuals. It's just a really unique type of cartoon. And I'm sitting in this Transformer, I guess, like lecture. I kept looking at this artwork of just multitude of images, um, and there was something from this Japanese artist. He had some amazingly dark, cool um, images that, that just right there in the room inspired me. I kept thinking to myself, I need to make this very real. I need to make this cool. I kept thinking about cars transforming at 80 miles an hour. Um, action images just would just kind of just come to my mind of like why would I be interested in doing this movie I did like the lore of Transformers it's very noble it's got good morals it's interesting but it's like how do you make Transformers understandable to an adult who has no knowledge of what Transformer toys are we broaden the story in terms of bringing in the American military it, it, it's this big story but it, it kind of comes down to this little story on earth which is all about Sam and having these glasses this is kind of how the birth of Transformers uh, happened I've always had the lucky fortune of working with military equipment uh, before anybody else, such as these Ospreys right here. Um, they've never been used in a movie, and uh, uh, I don't think many people have shot this, that stealth uh, 117 is either. So I've got this hotline to the Pentagon. I've got this relationship with, the uh, I think, the, the film liaison, Phil Strube, uh, who helped me on Armageddon, where we worked with the Air Force, and uh, Pearl Harbor, where we worked with the Navy and all the branches, and... Uh, uh, I called Phil up and I said, Phil, I'm going to be doing this movie. It's a fantasy movie uh, called Transformers. And he goes, oh, the kid's toy, huh? He said, uh, well, Mike, I, I, you know, if we did have alien robots on Earth, I think the American military would be involved and we will bring the fight anywhere we have to. So uh, let me read the script. I'm excited to read it. And uh, I guess the rest is history. He loved it. Um, uh, and then it's a matter of me going to different bases and trying to convince uh, bases to uh, be imitate Qatar, which is the forward command uh, for the whole Middle East. And we found Holloman Air Force Base um, in New Mexico, which kind of has these white sands, which are test missile ranges for, uh, I think, the Army. Why? We will use deadly force. Right here, this was done at Edwards. These are two F-22s, which are the brand new planes that are costing $130 million each. They can take out six F-16s before they can even be spotted. Um, they are just deadly lethal, and of course, I was the first to use those as well. Why does the military let me use this stuff? Because they look good at what they do in my movies. And um, working with these men and women, I, it, they're, you know, I've done many years of working with them in terms of in movies. And, um, you know, they're really great people and they're really dedicated. And I really admire them um, for the service they, 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 they do for the country. And, you know, they, they don't work for a great wage, and, and but they're just so dedicated to, to country and, uh, um, you know, so, like, just diligent and just, you know, I find many of them so intelligent and, uh, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's always been a great experience when I've worked on these bases and I, I really have fond memories of it. Um, and very much they're impressed with how the film industry, because we work very much like the military works in terms of the different hierarchy and how it works on our sets and crews. And uh, they're always very skeptical when we show up because they think we're going to be a bunch of Hollywood, but they always come away with, a, I'm sure, with a great respect and they, they tell us that. Um, that they come away with a great respect for what we do because they see it's so similar to the military. Have your crew step out or we will kill you. So this was our first transformation here. And um, the transformation was, how are we going to do this, basically? I had my animators do rough versions of it. But when we had this first version of that was the very first version I ever saw of that transformation. And it was done by an artist uh, named Keiji. 
He's Japanese. He speaks, like, no English. Uh, he is the absolute Rubik's Cube genius to figure those things out, of how those parts actually move and come together. I met Keiji in a very odd meeting at uh, Industrial Lights and Magic. I had about 30 ILM artists sitting uh, in a kind of high-def room where we are looking at the artwork that my, 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 my illustrators had worked for months. I mean, we're talking eight months on. And then I saw Optimus Prime's face in his first 3D kind of, uh, uh, I guess, iteration of him. He looked terrible. He had this fat, ugly face. And I'm like, you guys got to be kidding me. This is awful. What happened to Optimus? And uh, all of a sudden, in this small room, this guy pops up in the back and he goes, that Optimus Prime is an insult to the Japanese people! That is an insult to the Japanese! I want to do Optimus Prime! But you can tell someone else was obviously modeling Optimus Prime's fat, ugly face. And Keiji knew this. And so I said, Keiji, first of all, this is the most bizarre meeting I've ever been to. The biggest, funniest outbreak I've ever seen. And you know what? Just because of that, I'm going to let you work on Optimus Prime. So not only did Keiji do Optimus Prime in terms of the 3D modeling, but he did the amazing Rubik's Cube of how... Uh, we were going to transform these these uh, robots. Uh, what the military is very concerned of when when they do movies is they, they just want things to be accurate. They're very into like those uniforms. If they are not Qatar issue uniforms, we just can't use them. Um, right here, I shot this in the tank graveyard. These are old tanks. Uh, some are just kind of shells of other tanks where they actually put them out in the field uh, in this white sands and they use them as target practice. Uh, we actually started the shoot. Um, the very first day was uh, I shot this uh, little, I guess, Mars rover. Uh, I shot that. Uh, I got it assembled because I had this idea for a teaser. That was the very first teaser that came out this summer, uh, where we just began to start. We, we just started shooting. I just wanted to make to mark our date of July fourth and to say we were real. The very first day of of pre-production photography, I shot in the tank graveyard. My first days really never suck, but this one really sucked. I get to the set. I'm all excited, and I'm walking around with my viewfinder, ready to go, and I get on set an hour before call, and the hour passes, and then I'm waiting, okay, where's my crew? I'm like, this isn't good. My crew apparently was just eating dinner. And normally, when you when you get to set, you, you start, you, you show up, you either eat dinner before, so my cameraman, Mitch Amundsen, and my operators, everyone's eating, and I'm like, okay. And that pissed me off the first night, so I'm like, Mitch... This is a big movie, and you're not going to be eating your burritos anymore when I show up to set and I'm ready to work. So I think that kind of, that kind of, like, shook the ground of everyone for the first night. Um, because I, I got to tell you, when I come on the set, I'm, I'm like, I come in, they, 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 they joke on the set, he's, Bay's coming in hot. That means I like to work. I don't like to fart around and, and, and uh, I, you know, everyone knows that I, I, I do a lot of setups every day. Um, an average on a movie is 19 to 25. I do 50, 60, sometimes 75. And these are real setups. And, uh... I shot a lot of this movie um, very kind of suburbia, but I didn't kind of sex it up, you know, in terms of, you know, making this slick. This is a classroom that we all know about, we've all been to, and um, it's it's something that makes it more accessible, I think, to, to, to uh, everybody. And, um, like, I've never in my life ever shot in a Burger King, but you know what? We all eat at a Burger King or McDonald's or whatever, and it just makes it more everyday life. And I kind of like this kind of sci-fi movie coupled with this suburbia life. Um... So I thought it was a good mix. And casting Shia, I had actually started to look for, for kids, and I had my casting ladies scour the earth for the best 16, 17, 18, 19, 20-year-old kid that can play a 16-year-old out there. And we looked from London to Australia to Canada, and Ian Bryce was the first to mention to me Shia LaBeouf. Or LaBeouf. I call him Shia LaBeouf. Um, I said, well, I saw him in Constantine, and I've never seen the movie Holes, but in Constantine, he was playing a cab driver. He looked a little old. So... The kid came in, and uh, he was kind of skinny and, like, a little goofy and way overexcited. I'm like, dude, you got to calm down here. Um, you're just uh, auditioning with me at my office. And uh, he goes, wow, I just I, I want to be an action guy. I want to be a... Uh, it's just like, wow, I love your movies, and I can't believe I'm meeting you. I'm like, all right, calm down. Let's just do the audition. And um, uh, I just instantly liked his energy. Uh, in the audition, you know, we had... Some of our early, early written pages, where the dialogue really needed to be tweaked and made more real. And uh, sometimes it's actually good to read with some clunky dialogue. And you see how actors can fare through. Because um, a good actor can make any line sound good. And uh, uh, Spielberg will even tell you that. Um, 
that's the art of acting in a way. Uh, but I started throwing some stuff to Shia, like improving with him a bit in the audition. Um, my thing is I love finding actors that can improv because a lot of my filmmaking, we improv as we go. Um, when we have the basis of the scene. I mean, I kind of learned this on uh, working with Martin and Will on Bad Boys. Shia just had this great thing. And, uh, you know, at, I called Stephen and I said, I met with Shia. And Stephen goes, I love Shia. And um, so he was all excited about that. And I said, well, I really want to show you this tape. Um, I, I went downstairs and because I had auditioned a couple other kids. And I'm like, he just was heads and tails above every other kid um, that came in. And I asked the girls in the office, uh, my assistants were very blunt, I said, so what do you think of him? I said, just watch watch the DVD, watch the, watch, his, watch his thing. And they, they saw it and they got, like, oh my God, he's great, he's great, he's so funny, he's so charming, he's so funny. So I sent the audition to, to Steven and then I called Shia back. And um, meanwhile, I had to make this movie, movie for a price. And, and uh, I actually do some of my own actor deals because when I make a movie for a price, I make it for a price. And um, so I have to play tough guy. And I said, basically, if you want the part, you got 24 hours to decide on, this is what we're going to pay you. Yes or no, give me an answer 24 hours. So uh, sometimes that's the only way to get a deal done. And, uh, you know, I, I must say, it, 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 it's, it's, I'm very proud of the fact that we made this movie for 150 but I'll go into that later, okay? But uh, Shia, I guess he was my first snag on, on, uh, on the cast. And from there it followed to John Voight and then the amazing John Turturro, who I had always wanted to work with. Um, I originally thought of Steve Buscemi, but Steve was busy directing something, because I love working with Steve, and uh, Turturro is someone I've always loved, and uh, me being such a huge Coen Brother fan, it's like, well, anyone who can who can bowl and have a rose in their bowling ball is just, you know, I gotta work with that guy. From there, we kind of went on to get our female, and I looked at a lot of females. I just, uh, it was a very hard role to cast, and, uh, uh, Megan Fox is someone we auditioned for a movie I produced for Platinum Dunes um, for Amityville Horror. And um, I remembered her, and, and, and the ladies, my casting ladies, brought brought her brought her in, and I said I wanted to see her because I really liked her look. And uh, in person, she's very kind of timid and shy. She's from Tennessee, and uh, she had a sweetness about her. And I knew I had to make her tough. And she was very new at acting, um, but I just liked something about her there was something that, that that you know was more exciting to work with an actress who was fresh and um not done uh, a lot of movies and um uh so i had shia come in and work with her and um we we did several auditions with her and uh, uh working with megan she was so timid at the beginning uh just being on this big massive set and uh uh but she had a good, there was a good kind of chemistry between her and Shia. Shia was able to really lighten her up. And there were times I really had to make her tough. And, and every actor has a button you got to push once in a while. And, and you got to figure out what that button is when you're directing him. And her button was, because I couldn't get her to emote tough enough when she was, when she was like cutting that little robot in half with a, with a saw. And I, I, it just was looking way too girly, way untough. And I'm like, Megan, remember I told you when you, when you got this part, you had to be tough. And, uh, she told me she would hang out with mechanics or whatever to make this, this to get this movie part. Finally, her button was, I said, Megan, we have so much money on this movie, we will stay here all night long to get this one shot. I don't care if we stay here 15 hours, we're going to shoot it all night long, because you will hate this shot right now. You will, come here, we'll look at the monitor. And all of a sudden, that would get her angry, and would get her pissed. And that was her button, where she was able to really, like, give me, like, a moat and whatnot. Um, uh... And so anyway, I, th I just thought she had a good thing with her and Shia, and Shia was able to, to really throw a lot of things at her, and, and uh, you know, her problem was with his improv, uh, she just kept laughing through the take, so that wasn't good. Um, many of the times we had to CG her face out when she was laughing. No, I'm kidding, we didn't. Mojo the dog was kind of like an idea. I just, I love dogs, and, and like, you know what, a dog addicted to pain pills with a, with a cast, that's just funny. Um, so I said, you know what, to the writers, I said, let's put a dog named Mojo. And um, uh, so I auditioned uh, a bunch of chihuahuas, and uh, this one was, I guess, by far the best one. I mean, then I thought, well, what what better than having a, a, a chihuahua that's stoned eating pain pills that hovels up on his little penthouse of a, of a birdhouse? So you can tell, imagine when I'm telling the art department, I want to build this little silly little dog house, but it's, it's elevated. Well, this gives the movie audience a laugh, because that's just funny. <laughs> um, right here... 
the dad right here, this is my, my best friend, Robert Offer, who's my lawyer, who I've known since nursery school. He has a problem with his kids. He doesn't let his kids walk on his grass. And I've always, I save things up that I learn in life for movies. And I'm like, what neurotic dad doesn't let their kids walk on his own grass? Well, that's this is Robert Offer right now. Um, and this right here is complete improv, where this is just an example of how we're playing around with Kevin Dunn and, and Judy White. This amazing mom who just actually won a Tony, a Tony Award. At this time, we can't confirm whether there were any survivors. Our bases worldwide are, as of now, at DEFCON Delta, our highest readiness level. We're dealing with a very effective weapon system that we have not come across before. But our prayers are with the families of the brave men and women. And he's gonna be okay. I've never seen a weapon system like this. The thermo shows this weird aura around the exoskeleton like it's cloaked by some kind of invisible force field. That's impossible. There's no such thing as invisible force fields except, like, comic book stuff, right? Man, I don't know. What is that? My mama, she had the gift, you know? She saw things. I got the gene, too, and uh, that thing that attacked us, I got a feeling it ate over. How would you use those magic voodoo powers to get us the hell out of here, huh? When I took that picture, I think it saw me. It looked right at me. All right, we gotta get this thing back to the Pentagon right away. They gotta know what we're dealing with here. Our radio's fried. I got no communication with Ariel. Get my foot stuck. How far do you live from here? Not far. Just up that mountain. Do they have a phone? Yes. All right, let's hit it. Dude, are you sure we're invited to this party? Of course, Miles. It's a lake. Public property. This is a scene where, for Shia, you know, you've, or our character Sam, this is a, a, an experience where every guy's had this experience where the tough guy comes up and kind of tries to embarrass you in front of his friends. And um, this moment right here is the moment where I think every guy, first of all, identifies with him, but you like him instantly because he is able to come back with, with comedy and wit. This guy, John, right here, he jumps up on this tree, and I'm like, wait a minute, that's great, that's funny. I mean, what kind of kooky-ass friend would hang on a tree and make this kid embarrassed? So I wasn't going to make this kid the geek, because I didn't want the geek. I wanted the geek who was sharp, who was witty, but was able to come back with humor. And right here with this whole coloring book thing, it's uh, this is, I think, where you kind of fall in love with this kid. No, it's, it's a good book. Your, your friends will love it. You know, it's got mazes in it and, you know, little coloring areas, sections, pop-up pictures. It's a lot of fun. That's funny. People were very worried about the tone of this movie where it was very edgy and hard and then it had these funny kind of um, suburbia kind of touches. And, you know, I, you know, the, that's a thing that everyone talks about, the tone of the movie. They love the tone of the movie. And that's what, around the world, when I, when I did press for this movie, everyone talks about the tone and how funny it is and... Um, you know, that's just kind of what I like doing. It's, uh, um, my thing. Oh, God, I can't even tell you how much I'm not your little bunny. Okay. You'll call me. Who's gonna drive you home? Hey, man, what's wrong with your radio? I'm driving home tonight. What? She's an evil jock concubine, man. Let her hitchhike. She lives 10 miles from here, okay? It's my only chance. You gotta be understanding here, all right? Uh, all right, well, we'll put her in the back. I'll be quiet. Did you say put her in the back? I, I called Miles, shotgun. I'm not putting her in the back. You gotta get out of my car right Get now. the party hey, back. What rules? Uh, our bros before hoes. Miles, I'm begging you to get out of my car, okay? You, you can't do this to you me. You gotta get out of my car right now. So when I signed on to do this movie, uh, God, there was a lot of talk on the internet about Michael Bay will wreck this movie. He won't know how to do this movie. He doesn't know anything about Transformers. Um... You know, stuff like Michael Bay's Wrecking My Childhood, Death to Michael Bay. Boy, I had a lot of death threats, I must say. They even actually protest at one of my offices, but it was an office I had moved out two years prior. So, you know, I guess they weren't that smart to figure out where to protest. Um, but I remember listening to stuff on the Internet. Uh, I would listen to some of their ideas that they would talk about um, because fan support is very important, and I wanted them to be happy with... Uh, Transformers, but but I was trying to introduce a world of people that have never seen Transformers to this movie, and um, you know, and I think in a way it was better that I wasn't a, a a Transformer fan because I was able to make this movie more accessible and um, uh, to the non fan, I guess. So I must say, right now I am uh, uh, a true Transformer fan. I've probably thought about robots more than anybody in the past year and a half than any. I probably I thought about robots more than anybody else on Earth for the past year and a half. 
we would have artwork that would leak. I mean, it was truly the, one of the most sought-after movies and, and talked about on the Internet that and, and, and I can remember in a very long time. And our art server uh, had 39,000 attempted hacks in the month of January in the year 2006. And um, we had to literally get, like, almost Pentagon-type quality uh, encryption. Um, and it was... Uh, they actually personally hacked into my personal computer. Um, and uh, they were able to steal one script... And we know who stole it, and I was able to get the script back. But uh, luckily, it only got out once. So there were so many leaks that I decided to, to actually keep the script. Uh, just literally, I had the only original script uh, in my computer. Um, and I was, you know, certain actors had ones that are older, and everyone had coded scripts, and we collected all the scripts from the crew. We, we gave them out, gave them, they gave it back, and... Uh, all those different measures, and there was one script, a very old script that got out on the internet that everyone read, and everyone kept commenting on, and, um, but it was so old, scripts can change, in a month you can change so much in a script, um, and theirs was like probably five months older than what the script was in the movie, um, I mean, there were, we had, in case the script got out, we had names of our robots, aka names, but, uh, you know, there were, there were many characters that, that you know, I, 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 tried to create uh like let me give you an example we're working on this movie budgeting this movie and they have to make these toys like molds and like the idea of these type of molds a year and a half out we didn't even have a script and ian bryce came to me and says hasbro needs to know what transformer vehicles and what kind of, what are you using for the decepticons autobots and decepticons what kind of cars and i'm like literally i had to come to a choice with like okay i think maybe a tank um i, I don't know if we can get that amazing uh, bomb searching buffalo uh, truck that they that, that that that's brand new that they're sending to Iraq. If we can if we can maybe do that one, and I definitely if I can get an F twenty two, but I don't know if we can get F twenty two. Um, so that's how we kind of had to decide. We had to decide very quickly. <clears throat> there it is. I had fun. Um, so you know, thanks for listening. Oh yeah, yeah. You you think I'm shallow, huh? I think you should. No, 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 no. I think, um, there's a lot more than meets the eye with you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll, I'll see you at school. All right. That's stupid. That was a stupid line. There's more than meets the eye with you. That's stupid. Oh, God. Oh, my God, I love my car. The other team figured it out. Iran. Come on, man. This is way too smart for Iranian scientists. Huh? Think about it. What do you think, kid? Chinese? No, why? This is nothing like what the Chinese are using. This is Air Force One, level of flight level. We will hunt down this enemy. What we do, we know just what to do with it. I also wanted to make other characters like uh, like in the boombox um, on Air Force One. Uh, I like this kind of character, and I think if we do Transformers 2, we're going to have a lot more unique characters like this, but also bigger and just, you know, you can imagine where the mind can go here. I mean, I designed some, uh, with the artists, they, they, some amazingly huge characters. It just got to be too big, too costly, too expensive, whatever. Um, uh, and it was Steven who said, you know what, we should probably just keep this kind of like six against five or something where it's a little bit more manageable. And I, I, I think he's right that we keep it smaller to kind of try to introduce what's going on here. Steven says I saved 30 grand right there by doing that little one camera move. We had a guy grab the boombox. He's right. So I saved an effect. Um, and then right in here, this is our actually full scale puppet of this uh, uh, frenzy here. Frenzy was animated by uh, a French artist. Uh, at ILM that uh, I like this very quirky kind of movement and um, when I was directing the animation because I would actually every single day I would work with animators where they would send me down what they're working on so that I can actually direct them um, 
you know, after these shots that we've, you know, done these plate shots and trying to direct their acting. And uh, you, you, I got to tell these characters so well that I knew that when another artist was working on this Frenzy character, um, uh, he wasn't the French guy. I'm like, well, did you guys have a different animator working on this? And they're like, you hear kind of over the conference call, um, yeah. So, well, you got to put the French guy back on because it's a total different character. Um, uh, you know, and he says, well, he's on another, on another movie. He's working on Pirates. I said, well, you got to get the French guy back. Whatever you got to do, you got to get the French guy back. Someone! They're hanging into Air Force One. We need a senior analyst. I think they're planting a virus. A virus? It's dreaming right now. Yeah, they are planting a virus and stealing a whole lot of data from your system at the same time. Code red. We have a breach. Air Force One, someone on board has breached the military network. I'm in the cargo hold. Clear! Clear! Okay. you got to cut the hard lines. What? Whatever they want, they are getting it. Sir? Permission to take down the defense network. Cut all server hard lines now. Cut all server hard lines now. My theory on effects. Well, it, it, it all comes down to lighting. And I, I feel everyone in their brain has something that we don't really know that's there, but we can tell when something is not lit right. We don't know why it's there, but we, we just know there's something wrong with this shot, and it's all coming down to lighting. Because we're used to looking at the world the way we see it through our eyes. After I did Pearl Harbor, uh, Dennis Murin said to me, he says, you raise the bar on effects. And uh, I'm like, what did he mean by that? And he goes, you, you've just made effects more realistic. And the first time I went to ILM or use them was on Pearl Harbor. And I had a big meeting up there where I just felt that Lucas's stuff is awesome, but it's very pastel in terms of their light. It doesn't look real. The shadows aren't dark enough. Um, it's, it's, it doesn't have enough contrast. It doesn't have the right ref ripple reflections on metal. So that was one of the big achievements I think we worked with on Pearl Harbor in terms of shooting a movie at 12 o'clock noon and making it, uh, not disguising it at night and then showing it in broad daylight and, and, and making the planes as real as possible and all these other ships. And So I think that's what Dennis was talking about. Well, you know, this we had to take it to a brand new level in terms of trying to make reality here. Um, so we spent a tremendous amount of time and software and just trying to invent new tricks uh, on how to light these robots. Um, they use this process called ray tracing. Um, when you look at a car, you go out in a parking lot. I've shot a lot of car commercials, so you, you, I was trying to explain you can't just have one quality of light on a car on a piece of sheet metal. It will reflect soft light, hard light. It'll have pings. It'll have long lines. Cars are like a nightmare to light um, in terms of show, if you're actually doing a to total digital model of a car. So um, you probably couldn't have done this movie uh I guess as of two years ago. So in terms of our effects, um, we had Industrial Lights and Magic that were heading up Transformers, and we had Digital Domain, which is an effects company that I recently purchased with a couple other partners. Um, those are the ones that did... Uh, both companies did the work for this movie. Um, ILM did... Uh, three quarters, and Digital Domain did the last quarter. ILM came down, and, and they talked to me about, like, the... Something that was used in Star Wars 3 is a digital model of a character uh, that was kind of like a robot, and it was so uncomplicated. I'm like, guys, we have to go so much farther than this. General Grievous was ILM's most complicated digital model at the time, and it was, if you look at it, it's so simple compared to the complexity that we needed to do our, our models. At. And they talked about... These models, which finally, when they were done, Optimus Prime is made of 10,108 parts that all have to move, not intersect, and uh, uh, it's in, in just an immensely uh, complicated um, digital model. They, 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 they say they're the most complicated digital models ever made. My name is Sam McWiggy. Whoever finds this, my car is alive, okay? So this is actually Shia's first night, and you can see his nappy hair right now. I, I, I just kept looking at his hair. I said, dude, we got to do something with your hair. And he says, Mike, what's the matter with my hair? He says, it just looks, it's just nappy. We gotta, we gotta make it cooler. And I wasn't allowed to cut it because he was still shooting Disturbia. And this is his first scene for the movie. And those dogs chasing him are actually killer police dogs. And Shia's running and there's a man in a big dog suit stands behind him. And he was there with a whip and he was calling the dogs. Well, they actually missed the guy with the big dog suit where they're supposed to chomp on the arm. And they kept going after Shia. <laughs> Shia was almost killed that night. I am not kidding you. Thank God he was fast. Uh, it wasn't good when the uh, the guy with the whip he says, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> the whole crew started chasing after the dogs with the big chains on their necks, so we were able to tackle them. Listen, listen, listen. Good, you're here. Missing your hands. No, 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 it's not me. The guy's inside. Shut up. Walk towards your car. Put your head on the hood. If 
if you have military assistance, you have to have advisors on the set that are from the Pentagon that uh, make sure that we're doing things correctly. They won't tell us like what lines we have to say and what we can't say, but it's just got to be accurate. Where Rachel here had to go into this room, I was just going to have her slip into the room, but we had to have this other guy knock on the window. That was the only way they were going to let me do this shot because they would say there would be no way in the Pentagon for her to slip into a private room like this. So you've got to make these little concessions here and there. Um, and I said to the guy, are you sure that would never happen? No way. That would be impossible. Are you sure? <laughs> Nope, that's impossible. So, okay, I'm like, all right, this is the way we got to block the scene. Satellite imagery shows North Korea doubling its naval activity. Maybe it's a precaution because isn't that what we're doing? The signal pattern is learning. It's evolving on its own, and you need to move past Fourier transfers and and start considering quantum mechanics. There is nothing on Earth that complex. What about an organism? A living organism, maybe some kind of DNA-based computer. And I I know that that sounds crazy. That's enough. That's enough. We have six floors of analysts working on this thing. Now, if you can find proof. To back up your theory, I'm going to be happy to listen to you. But if you don't get a filter on that brain mouth thing, you're going to be off the team. You understand? Look, I can't be any clearer on how crystal clear I am being. It just stood up. Just stood up. Wow. It's really neat. Okay, Chiffy. Time to fill her up. I know, drippy, drippy. What are you rolling? Whippets, goofballs? Little wowie sauce with the boys? No, I'm not on any drugs. What's these? Turn in your pocket. Mojo. Is that what the kids are doing now? A little bit of mojo. Those are my dog's pain pills. Yeah, Chihuahua. Little... What was that? Hmm? You eyeballing my piece, 50 Cent? Oh, you want to go? Make something happen. Do it. Because I promise you, I will bust you up. Are you on drugs? This is actually the very first day of official shooting right here. The New Mexico White Sands. Let's hope this telephone line works. What the heck was that? No sé, cagano. El edredo por poco me rompe el culo. English, dude. English. The way we made this Scorponox work was I, 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 I remember something we did in Armageddon where we did these pyro, primer cord explosions that, that um, primer cord's like a very stable kind of explosive device. That we did like, it's, like, it's like rope. And we put like 150 of these in a row and they would, they had a computer that was able to fire them in milliseconds apart from each other so it made a ripple effect. And that's how we did this shot right here with this ripple shooting up and the thing jumping out right behind them. Um, I remember doing the animatic for that shot, saying, you know what, that shot's a trailer shot. And um, that was Tyrese's second day, um, where the guys actually had to run over a carpet of explosives as the stuff was fired behind them. And I'm like, guys, do not stop, do not trip, and um, we're going to fire these things off, and uh, this stand's going to go, because it will really hurt your foot. So that that look is, uh, I guess, one of fear and real uh, terror there. Um, a lot of these guys, these, these, these rangers here, are the real deal. They're actually, uh, many of them are very decorated United States SEALs and rangers. This scene right here with Josh was something that I remember a real SEAL telling me that happened down in Grenada where they were trapped in a house, they lost all their comms, and they had a cell phone and they had to call to the Pentagon and literally had to get a credit card to get out of the country and link up with, a, with an operator at the Pentagon to get an airstrike to come in, and they had to vector in their position. So something I always held in my, uh, my, my ideas of uh, wanting to get into a movie, and so this was an idea of making it kind of fun and serious at the same time, and I just like the whole chain of events and how fast you can see this airstrike come in. And, it's called an Air Force Combat Controller. That's what Tyrese plays. And uh, an Air Force Combat Controller is a guy who actually... It's, it's a job that a guy can use a gun. He can help them in battle, but he's a very important tool in terms of getting very deadly air support, which is what they call danger close, which is where they'll shoot missiles uh, and they give a precise position where the, the friends are and they will give a precise position where the foes are. And these missiles will sometimes come in 50 feet, 20 feet. Um, that's why they call it danger close there. You know, sometimes you think we're movieizing this thing up where the guys are coming in with, uh, um, I guess those laser sighting things on their guns. Um, that's called marking a target. What is that? We need air support. 
Martin, we need it now. Rolling strike package Bravo on unknown target. I authenticate Tango Whiskey at time 0300 Zulu. Digital aircraft, this will be a danger close fire mission. These guys on the, uh, on the, the AWACS, that was done at Edwards Air Force Base. That, that, literally, I told these guys on the AWACS, these are all the real guys. I said, to the guy in charge of the AWACS, I said, how would you run this mission? This is what's going down on the ground. This is what's happening. And he could, and literally within three minutes, these guys were talking. This is I did not add one line here. This is exactly how they talk. That's as fast as they talk. And literally, we were capturing it like a documentary. Uh, it's amazing how fast everyone's talking over each other and uh, a multitude of things going on. And what's going on, Josh, right now is laser designating uh, the for these missiles coming in right now. And that's actually how it's done. These uh, warthogs are, are, I must say, very kind of scary because they've got a very low kind of sound to them, and they uh, they get very low to the ground, and uh, they're slow enough where you can see them, and it's just it's got this evil whine to it, and they're just so deadly. These things. No freaking way! That thing's still not down. Spooky three two use 105 shells. Bring the rain. Be advised, ground teams requesting 105 sable rounds. Scorpinox was our first scene that we shot, and it was uh, one of the first scenes that was kind of digitally completed, and uh, that was kind of, I guess, the basis of how these Transformers should look. I started showing some of my friends this scene, and everyone kept saying, well, what is it, an animation? What is it? And then I'd show them this scene, and then instantly, this is a scene, they go, I get it. I understand the movie now. Um, you're doing this kind of in a real-life way, and um, it's got fun, and, uh, you know, it's a uh, kind of sci-fi kind of to it, and so I guess this is when we started to convince a lot of people. Like, even the Japanese came in, the Toho distributors. I had to do a lot of dog and pony shows for a lot of people. Um, because, uh, you know, we were the, I guess, one of the very few non-sequels of the summer. And um, we had to kind of position ourselves. And a lot of theater owners, they go, well, what is Transformers? I don't get it. So we did this little compilation reel of 20 minutes. And it was something that we started showing around to theater owners and uh, uh to try to get people on board to understand what we have here. Because everyone thought, this is kind of, what is it, silly? Is it animation? Is it this? Is it that? We started showing people this. Like, for example, Toho, which is the biggest uh, movie, I guess, distributor ownership in, in Japan, which is a gigantic market. Uh, they came into my trailer. I showed them 20 minutes of stuff. And literally, you just heard the word, oh. And I guess that meant good in Japanese, and they, they upped our estimate. They doubled our estimate of what we're going to make in Japan, and uh, they, they gave us the number one house, Toho, uh, uh, you know, I guess chain in uh, Japan. And, um, but that reel was a way to really get uh, people on board with this movie, and, uh, uh, you know, because I kind of knew what we had early on, and, um, uh, you know, I remember going in to see my very first fight in Vegas, a live fight, Oscar De La Hoya. And I walked in, and there was Peter Chernin, who I'm friendly with, and, you know, good jovial fun. And he's walking in with his friend, and, the, and he goes, so, I hear you got Transformers. And I said, so, I hear you got Die Hard. And I'm like, yeah, they're the same date. And I just kind of said, yeah, but you'll move, don't worry. And, of course, they moved. You know, it's like, it's got kind of a game of chicken. I think they saw our our, our second teaser. We wanted it to be a hard edge teaser because we wanted to, to show the fans that we're going to do a serious, cool Transformer movie. And we weren't making it too kiddie. And it was going to, uh, you know, appeal to the 30-year-old uh, uh, guy and girl that, that uh, you know, grew up with Transformers. As well as, you know, the younger kids that, uh, you know, are just getting into it. Looks like there's a message embedded in the signal. Let me work my magic. Project Iceman. What's Sector 7? Who's Captain Wickwicky? Are you playing those video games again? So you can tell right here. I mean, this guy, uh, you know, uh, Omar right there. Uh, he wasn't in the script, but I always add weird stuff like this right here. Bam, going through the glass. Why are we doing that? I don't know. It's funny. All right? That's just my humor. Um, so this is where the studio goes, what are you doing? Is this director out of his mind? Um, but, you know, when you see it in a, every single movie theater I've seen it around the world, they all laugh. Um, you know, what can I tell you? 17s lifted off of this very base. We are not told where they're going. The government is being very quiet about what's going on. No but in joke, our opinion, no they were headed directly towards North Korea. Let's stop at the parking mojo. It's too early, please. We had 145 million to make this movie. That doesn't sound like a lot. I mean, it's, it sounds like a lot, but it's really not. When you look at some of these movies like Pirates, which is 350, and then Spider Man, which is 325, and I don't even know how you spend that much money on a movie. Um, I'm really proud of the fact that we did this movie for ultimately 151 at the end of the day. Uh, we were very judicious about where we use the effects, and I must say a lot of that is attributed to Steven, because Steven would put the reins on me. And literally, Steven is very, very tough about budget. He wanted me to think really hard about 
how many effects I use and to use them and choose them wisely. He would say like, listen, when I did Jurassic Park, it was only 50 something effects and we all remember it as more. When I did War of the Worlds, it was only 117 effects. I kind of thought, are you kidding now? I think it would be more than that. So he really got me to thinking how to use my effects wisely and, and you know, because they can get very pricey and uh, that's where the budget can just balloon. And uh, So I literally animated the whole movie in terms of every scene where we were going to do big effects. Literally, a lot of these effects in the movie are exactly how we did them on our little mile files in my office. I started to get excited about potentially what I can visually show. Like this shot right here of Shia going in, this whole scene. A kid on his stupid mom's bike that is now going to confront a monster. I kept thinking, this could be a movie. Every kid has to have a movie that they own. You know, when me growing up, it was like E.T. and really like Raiders of the Lost Ark and Star Wars. Those are two movies that kind of, you know, there's seminal moments in my childhood of like cool movies I saw. And um, that's what I wanted this movie to be for kids. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's something that new and different that they can discover. It's not a repeat of something. It's... it's, it's uh, uh, yeah, I can't tell you how many kids have come up to me um, saying, it's my favorite movie I've ever seen. I love Transformers. I can't wait to see Transformers 2. It's just, you know, this is why you do movies. And I think people responded to it because it was kind of new and different. And uh, um, But what I'm surprised about, really surprised about, is the massive age range this movie uh, had from, you know, 50, 60-year-olds to, I mean, young four-year-olds. I don't get that. I don't see how four-year-olds can see this movie and you know, I think it's too scary or whatnot. And I don't know if I really believe parents bringing their kids to a movie like this when they're that young. I think what really inspired me to do this movie were, were, were not only the animatics, but the illustrations. The movie started to become more real, and I just, there was a charm about the movie. I, I like this whole magic of these two kids kind of uh, discovering these things. And, uh, um, um, you know, my, my, my favorite scene, I think, in this movie is, uh, it seems, it's kind of ironic. It's kind of, I'm thinking back, it's like, all my movies, like, first hour in, I always had, there was always one montage, kind of, you can kind of see this in all my movies, like The Rock, Sean Connery and Nick Cage breaking it into the rock, and then an Ar uh, uh, Armageddon, the, the astronauts lifting off, um, or uh, Pearl Harbor, the Japanese kind of getting ready to attack, or the asteroids coming in and landing and um, um, the, the kids meeting the Autobots. I kind of, kind of, a theme, I guess, in my movies, I do these montages that uh, uh, really inspire me, and um, they always seem to happen an hour in, but that's kind of my favorite scene when you see Optimus kind of transform in front of the kids. So, like, when we're doing scenes like this, I'm sometimes, oftentimes, in the car with Shia and Megan, and uh, we're driving with a stunt driver, and we're driving very fast and controlled, but it's, it's, uh, um, really gets their adrenaline going, I must say. We're locked in. The car won't start. At least we did some monster, right? Actually, I'm very, uh, as Shia always says, I'm the director that will put my knee pads on and I'll be right next to the actors. Um, um, when I do action, uh, oh god, you hear these rumors, it's the guy they love to just get on to the, oh, Michael yells, Michael's a screamer, blah blah blah. Um, no, Michael's like a, a tough ass basketball coach that is in your face, especially when you're doing action. For one, because of safety. Two, because I'm trying to get your adrenaline level where I think it needs to be for that scene. Um, how many action scenes do you see there? It seems like actors are just kind of walking through it. Um, I really want that adrenaline to be real, and I want you to look energized, you know, so that, that's kind of how I work. Um, you know, it, so the, 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 the screaming only comes, I guess, when I'm doing tough action, and uh, I want you to get to that energy level, and, you know, and it's also, it's also, you know, a lot of, a lot of these times, I'm, I'm very safety conscious, and I take it personally. And I'm like my own AD on my sets. Um, I, I work with an AD. I work with Simon this time. And um, uh, but I, I uh, I'm very much. I move my sets forward for myself, and I want everyone to know what I'm thinking. And, and and I'm vocal about it. Like we're moving over here. We're going over here. And so I just I, I've got a good projecting voice that you know, like let's let's get our day done and let's let's like do it. And, you know, granted. I like to laugh just like the next guy, and I tease. I am a professional teaser with my crew. And it's funny when you see new crew members come on, they're day players, whatever, and I'm teasing because I, I, I'll, I'll, like, I'll, I'll act it like I really mean it. You know, I'm totally screwing around with people, but uh, my, my crew that's been with me for 16 years, they all know that I'm screwing around with you, but uh, I like picking on people. And I like being picked on too, you know, just as long as you're good at picking on people. It's fun. 
Um, but I do like to have a good environment on the set, and uh, um, and especially work with people that uh, I really like being around. That that look at their their look at it as a career and not as a job. Um, because let me tell you, I know everyone's job on the set. I've been doing this since I'm 24, and um, um, I will be the first to point out to you when you're not doing a good job. But um, you know what? A director is only as good as his or her crew, and um, the studio wanted to ship me off to Australia and then to Canada. We went to check out Canada. I felt Australia was too far away, and we went up to Canada, and I just like, oh, my God. I was trying to make it work, trying to make it work, looking around, scouting, and I realized this will be a waste of money. It'll be a, it, it, it'll, it'll just be, a, it's just, there's no way the crew can do the serious kind of uh, stunt work that we really do on our sets, because uh, um, they just don't have a lot of great stunt work up there, and uh, you got to ship in too many people, and it just would be a lost cause, and so, you know, the studio gave me some grief for not going up there, and uh, so I ended up giving 30% of my fee so I can shoot with my crew in America, and, uh, you know, that's because I'm loyal to my crew, and they're just, I, they're, I, I think, the best. So just from heaven, what? What, are you like an alien or something? <laughs> The sound work was done by Ethan Van Ryn and Mike Hopkins, who uh, did the sound work for Lord of the Rings and King Kong. Um, Mike is from New Zealand. Ethan is, uh, I guess, was trained up at Lucasfilm. And I must say, awesome sound. When you listen on this DVD, it is just awesome sound. My mixers, Kevin O'Connell and Greg Russell. Um, Kevin, by the way, is, is the biggest Academy loser in Academy history. He's lost, I think, 20 times. Um... He's done some amazing movies. He's an amazing mixer. As a team, they're amazing mixers. And Kevin and and Greg said to me in the, in their in all their time of mixing, they felt this was the most inventive sound work they've ever worked with. Um, and meanwhile, they feel it's one of their finest sound designs uh, and and mixing uh, efforts that they've done as of yet. We had to invent so many different sounds here, and uh, uh, it just gives these robots such personality. And uh, it's really just a launching pad for where we can go on uh, number two. Right? Yeah. Okay. There you go. See, that's better. Yeah, that seatbelt thing was a pretty smooth move. <laughs> Thank you. You know what I don't understand? Hmm. Why, if he's supposed to be like this super advanced robot, does he transform back into this piece of crap? Come here. I have no idea why this scene right here, and I've seen this movie from Korea to Australia to all over Europe. Um. America, just why, right here in the movie, they applaud when this yellow car comes up. Oh, that shot, let me tell you about that shot right there. That was the most patient I've ever been for doing a stunt in the history of my career. Um, that took exactly three and a half hours for that guy to go up on two wheels. Why was he on two wheels? Well, he was on two wheels because, I don't know, I wanted the guy up on two wheels and, uh, you know, wanted to go old school with a stunt there. Um, that Camaro was a, a prototype that I saw I was looking through all these car companies, new kind of prototypes that are coming out, and I saw this at the Skunk Works at GM. It's this little kind of secret building in California where they do kind of these concept cars, and I kind of knew right away that was the car. That was going to be Bumblebee, and uh, the fans were going to give me grief because it wasn't a Volkswagen, but there's just no way I could do this movie if this was a VW Bug, and uh, um, um, so I just felt this was uh, that was a car. So there's a scene with this uh, little girl in her bed, and uh, you know this the, the, this girl was five, and I actually hired two of them for the exact same scene, and I shot one shot with one, another one literally with the other girl, and we go like flip them back and forth because I knew, um, like the, the the studio teacher that comes with the kids, the kind of social worker that watches the kids, uh, um, she said, I've never seen a director in my 20 years ever hire two girls for the same role. And I said, well, at 1130 at night, when, when we have 20 minutes left on our time where you have to take the kids, we're doing the most important shot with this robot getting out of the pool. And I guarantee you, one of them will crap out. And sure enough, by the time we got to the pool, uh, one of them had crapped out. And uh, so we used a little blonde girl. Um, this was a fun night for the crew, I must say, because uh, we're up there at this house. It's 8 o'clock at night. And I said to the guys, so what crane do we have? And everyone kind of looked at me. It was like the silent look, uh, uh, Crane, uh, 
Uh, well, well, guys, you saw the animatic, what we need to do, right? We have to move this, like, long move and whatever. Well, let me tell you, they called everywhere, every place around Hollywood. I don't know how they manufactured this weird-ass crane, but anyway, we got to do this shot, and this was the very first take with a girl. Now, this is very hard, because she has to follow this pole above her six times, and right there, when she, when she does that little stutter step, I just loved it, because she tripped, and it just looked more real. Um... And ILM said, whoa, just use the other shot because she looks like she's screwing up. I said, that's what it's about. It's about a kid screwing up. That's what it is. Oh my God, what happened to the pool? Well, the concept car, uh, you know, because we only had one in the world, we had to actually build it. And once we got the CAD files and the OK, it's very hard to get CAD files from a car company because of thievery or whatever they call it. This shot right here with Optimus transforming, um, this is one of the shots we made very early on in the animatic process that got me excited about the movie. Um, this is almost verbatim to our animatic and uh, that we created in my office. And I think this moment right here, when I finally heard all the sounds of the, 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 uh, with Peter Cullen's amazing voice, that thank God the fans actually, I kept listening to the fans, and they were right. You guys were right all the way through. But I just wanted to have an open mind of who can play these robots, so um, you, know, you can't fault me for that. But that was Optimus Prime when he speaks, let me tell you. But when Ethan and Mike added those sounds to Optimus, it just it just made it come to life. And you know, when you look at these effects right here, it's just so real in terms of like the reflections of the metal and how they fit in. But you can call us Autobots for short. Autobots. What's cracking, little bitches? My first lieutenant. Designation Jazz. This looks like a cool place to kick it. What is that? How do you learn to talk like that? We've learned Earth's languages through the World Wide Web. My weapon specialist, Ironhide. You feeling lucky, punk? Easy, Ironhide. Just kidding. I just wanted to show him my cannons. You know, there's a whole thing about the, the in, in Transformers about mass shifting, and to me, that was just always a complex thing. It was very hard to to get across in movie making, and uh, I, I wanted to keep the idea of the the, the, the robots. If, if you're coming from a vehicle, you've got to kind of stay that same size of whatever that vehicle you could possibly stretch it out to. So, yeah, I got some flack about changing Optimus from a long nose, uh, um, from a flat nose to a long nose. And um, yeah, the long nose just made him so he can be 28 feet instead of the, the, the 20 feet that he, that, uh, he would have been with a flat nose truck. And, um, you know, I got a lot of flack for that. Um, and then I got more flack for putting uh, uh, flames on Optimus. Boy, I mean, it was literally death threats all started over again. And... Um, uh, the damn you, Michael Bay, and whatever the hell it was. I mean, it's just, you know, I wanted flames. I mean, if you want a pink house, I want a greenhouse. What's the difference? I'm a director, and it's just, that's what I wanted. And, and uh, you know, I knew the flames were barely visible when you saw him when he was transformed, and it kind of gave the, the, the impression that he had ribs, and um, it was a picture of a truck that I saw, and uh, I wanted to copy it. And, uh, you know, I must say, uh, I went to my Teamster captain, um, and I said, you know, they're 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 in charge of painting vehicles, and I said I said I, I'm telling you, a white guy is not allowed to paint those flames. Okay, I want what we call in L.A. I want a cholo. I want a guy who is an artist who knows how to do these amazing kind of cholo cars. It's art. Find them. All right. And so the funniest picture I got in this entire movie was our guy. He's from Mexico. He had a cup of coffee with his hat backwards. He's sitting in the art uh, kitchen. Uh, they took a picture of him and said, here he is. This is your guy. He doesn't speak any English. We're going to use an interpreter. But he does amazing flames. And I got to tell you, they were the most beautiful flames I've ever seen. <laughs> we made a discovery. He accidentally activated his navigation system. <laughs> the coordinates to the cube's location on Earth were imprinted on his glasses. How'd you know about his glasses? eBay. I must say, I did audition Peter Cullen twice. They wanted me to go with uh, Frank Welker for Megatron. To me, Frank Welker, great voice artist, but um, it just sounded too cartoon to me, and I, I don't think I could really tell Frank to change it for this movie. It just wouldn't feel right, so... Um, 
early on in the process when I picked certain actors uh, to be what I would interpret that character to be. Like, let me give you an idea. Liam Neeson was Optimus Prime. Um, Michael J. Fox was Bumblebee. Um, Hugo Weaving was Megatron. And, you know, just in terms of movies that I wanted the artist to look at, to, to kind of emulate, um, not the way they move, but just how regal, like, Liam Neeson is to, you know, uh, Hugo Weaving. And it's just his voice, Hugo's voice, just kept sticking in my head for Megatron. One of my producers, Lorenzo Bonaventura, who used to run Warner Brothers, he did the Matrix movies, and he called Hugo and got him into doing this. And Hugo was down in Australia, and I was directing him from here via uh, iChat, and... Uh, uh, they had the movie down there, and it was amazing how I was able to direct him so far away and modern technology. And but he just had it; he just has an awesome voice for Megatron. Walk through that door, you don't say nothing. She did! She did it! She's the one you want! All right, I was just sitting at home watching cartoons, playing video games with my cousin, and she came in there. Blink, all right. Blink. I'm not going to jail for you or anybody else. I have done nothing bad my entire life. Hey, man, I'm still a virgin. Okay, so what? I, I downloaded a couple of thousand songs off the internet. Who has it? Who has it? God Blaine, shut it. up. No, you shut up. Don't talk to me. Don't talk to me, criminal. So I never get sick when I shoot. Um, you just kind of have this adrenaline that carries you, you know, for a full year and a half, two years, um, through a movie. Um, but one day... We had I had a little vacation down in Cabo because I guess there was a, a union break we had. I, and uh, uh, I leaned down in the elevator of Air Force One. And I'm like, uh-oh, uh-oh. Maybe I got a little Cabo Wabo, something going on there. And within an hour, I just got violently uh, sick with the flu. And I'm sitting in my chair and I'm shaking and I'm sweating. And I'm like, I'm okay, I can drag, I'm okay, I'm okay. And uh, you know how you get when you get flu -y. So I went outside to the trailer and I had to lie down on the asphalt because I was so cold. I'm shivering. And my producer, Ian Bryce, is standing there and says, buddy, you got to go. I said, no, no, I, I've never gone home ever, ever in my career, ever gone home sick. No, I'm not going home. And then we had some gigantic days, like literally two days away, we were had to shoot downtown at the cost of like 375 each. And it's a big deal to shut all that stuff downtown. And uh, uh, then the set doctor came by and she says, you got 102 and a half, you got to go home. So... Uh, anyway, I kicked it kind of, sort of, like the next day, whatever, but I was sick and kind of whatever, and I had to uh, direct my trailer, so they had a microphone, and uh, I was kind of like Coppola in the, in the Silverfish where he would direct, with it, but he had a jacuzzi in his. But I was trying to direct my crew, and they were so slow without me on the set. We went from 50-something setups a day to 15, and I'm on a microphone, and it was just like, guys, you are so slow. What's going on? Uh, it was pretty funny. Well, God. One more thing. Huh? All right, I love you. Sleep good, handsome man. What are you doing? What are you doing? No, watch the bath. Watch the bath. Watch the bath. Please, please, please. No, no, wait. No, no. Oops. No. Sorry, my bad. Oh, I got you. You couldn't wait for five minutes. You couldn't wait for five minutes. I told you to stay. Just stay. I told you. Watch. I told you. Okay, you know what? They seem to be in a little bit of a rush. Rush is bad. No. Mojo, Mojo, off the rope! I got it. <laughs> Wait, no, 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 easy, easy, hold on, hold on. Oh, this is Mojo, this is Mojo. Need a better one, need a better one. Okay, that's all. Mm. Just, just put the guns away, put the guns away. Please. You have a rodent infestation, oh, shall I terminate? No, 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 it's not a rodent, it's a chihuahua. This is my, this is my chihuahua, we, we love chihuahuas, don't we? So, you know, working on these scenes, you know, they're looking at literally window washer poles uh, with different heights. And uh, those arms, we had two window washer poles with, with tennis balls on them so that they can actually kind of have an eye line to watch. Um, uh, but it it makes it kind of hard when you're you're trying to do camera moves without things there and uh, trying to imagine what fits in and that's why the animatics were huge helps for the actor to see. Um, there are times like this. I this is a shot I made up on the fly. Uh, just having Optimus look in. You did not. Any injuries again? You didn't even ground him. Almost. Almost. No. 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 Oh, come on. I always do these crazy things like this should have been a set but I like shooting in a real house where I had the access to the outside and um, you know but the houses are always way too small and locations are small it's just sometimes locations just feel better to me and uh, even though this is a minuscule room we're shooting in the crew it's sometimes ridiculous right there she grabbed that box that was kind of an improv thing and he ran over I mean that's got to be his porn box I would think you know every boy's got that somewhere in the room and uh, I guess we all understand that don't we <laughs> What now? No. No. No, no, no. 
This isn't hiding. This isn't hiding. This is my backyard, not a truck stop. Oh, God. Oh. Okay, I saw it. The UFO landed right here, and now it's gone. My moped's under there, man. Who's gonna pay for that? Oh, no, no, no. This Oops. is my mother's flat. Okay, listen, you gotta listen to me. If my parents come out here and they see you, they're gonna freak out. My mother's got a temper, okay? We must have the glasses. I know you need the glasses. I've been looking everywhere. They're not here. They're definitely not here. Ugh, keep searching. Look, I need you to Maybe we get facial motions like this from Optimus. I'd actually... The animators up north or down here at DD would kind of imitate something, video themselves or whatnot, and then they'd kind of animate how... That would work, or we'd actually use actors to do certain things. We wouldn't use motion capture like you would hear. Be quiet, you want us to be quiet. What's with the bat? Who are you talking to? I'm talking to you. Why are you so sweaty and filthy? I'm a child. You know, I'm a teenager. We heard voices and noises, and we thought yeah, maybe. It doesn't matter what we, we thought. Were... What was that light? No, what light? What, what? There's, no no light light. There's no light. You got two lights in your hand. There was That's a light what the light is. No, maybe the door. Look, you can't, you can't just bounce. First time I showed the scene to Stephen, I said, Stephen, I want you to. You know, I'm almost done with my rough cut. I want you to see some scenes. And he goes, no, no, no. I want to see the movie when it's all done. And I go, come on, Steven. I want you to see this scene. So he was watching this scene, particularly around the house, the robots around the house. And it was hysterical because he kept hitting me on the leg and laughing like a kid. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he goes, I have never seen robots do this. <laughs> and I said, it, was just, it was a funny moment because considering I filed his Raiders of Lost Ark storyboards and now this guy's slapping me on the leg saying he's never seen robots. And I'm like, but you're the dude that's invented dinosaurs and uh, you've seen everything. And he goes, but I've never seen this. And so that was kind of a fun moment. Also a funny moment when, when we were doing the, the, we saw the first cut at my house in my screening room. He kept giving me high fives when he was watching the movie. <laughs> Spielberg giving me high fives when he's watching the movie. <laughs> when a good scene would come out, you'd see his arm go up, bam, another high five. <laughs> but, you know, when I do scenes, I actually, when I'm doing the illustration and the animatic process, like a shot like this, this was like a seminal shot you base these scenes around. And so this shot was created very early on um, uh, in the uh, uh, animatic process. You know, and that, those are the scenes that kind of hang my hat on, or those are what the charm of the movie is. Fine, Hyde, you know we don't harm humans. What is with you? Well, I'm just saying we could. It's an option. Uh -huh. I heard you talking to somebody, Sam. We want to know I, who. I, I, I... Hi, I'm Michaela. I'm a, I'm a friend of Sam's. <laughs> Gosh, you're gorgeous. Oh, so she can hear you talking to him. Thank you. Oh, my goodness, I'm sorry you had to hear our little family discussion. Sorry, everybody. Come on, backpack. Come on, let's go. it's in the kitchen. John Turturro, um, <laughs> in his character study, he kept saying he was trying to imitate me. Now, I don't understand how his character is even the slightest bit imitating me, because that's not who I am. <laughs> but according to him, that's what I am. See, I would never do that. Ronald Wickety? It's with Wiki. Who are you? With the government, Sector 7. John's character, he kind of, we kind of felt that he was a Sector 7 agent, that uh, his, his, his great great grandfather was a sector 7 agent he's been in been doing it for generations it was actually in the movie in some of the dialogue when we actually cut it out it made it pretty funny for his character he thinks he still lives with his mom and whatnot um he was questioning questioning his sexuality in this movie um i, I just didn't think that was really necessary john i don't think we have to really go there i think you're a guy okay so just let's keep it at that all right <laughs> he was a great delight to work with um uh, he has the best Scorsese imitation you have ever seen. I think we must have that. We must have that with the pants and somewhere in the making of. Yeah? Well, I need you to come with us. Well, I'm way out of line. Sir, I am asking politely. Back off. You're not taking my son. Really. You're going to try to get rough with us? No, but I'm going to call the cops because yeah. there's something fishy going on around here. <laughs> there's something a little fishy about you, your son, your little Taco Bell dog, and this whole operation you got going on here. What operation? That is what we are going to find out. I think direct contact. 
Son? Yeah? Step forward, please. Just stand. Fourteen rats. Bingo! Tag him and dang him! You heard my dog! I don't know where we found this little dog stick, but I just thought that was a funny moment. I said, put that thing around the dog, please. Mom walks out and she says, I'll kick your ass. No, that's just, Judy's a funny woman. So, uh, ladies man 217, that is your eBay username, right? Yeah, but, you know, it was a typo and I ran with it. What do you make of this? My name is Sam Ricky, okay? And my, is that you? Uh, car is yeah, that, that sounds like ladies man. Last night at the station, you told the officer your car transformed. Enlighten me. What, here's what I said, okay? Because this is a, a total misunderstanding that my car had been stolen. Really? From me, um, from my home, and, but it's fine now because it's back. It came back. Well, not by itself. Well, no. Because cars don't do that because that would be crazy. <laughs> 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 That's crazy. Oh, so what do you kids know about aliens, huh? Oh, you like a Martian? Like what, E.T.? <laughs> no. Uh, it's an urban legend. Yeah. You see this? This is like a do whatever I want and get away with it badge. Right. I'm gonna lock you up forever. Oh God, you know what? Don't listen to him. He's just pissy because he's got to get back to guarding the mall. You, in the training bra, do not test me. Especially with your daddy's parole coming up. What? Parole? It's nothing. A Grand Theft Auto, that ain't nothing? You know those cars my dad used to teach me to fix? Well, they, they weren't always his. You stole cars? Well, we couldn't always afford a babysitter, so sometimes he had to take me along. She's got her own juvie record to prove it. She's a criminal. Criminals are hot. Well, it'd be a real shame if he had to rot in jail the rest of his natural life. It is time to talk. We actually hung these actors uh, on this little contraption that would spin them around. I got in the car with the operators, and uh, it was quite fun. Um, I gotta tell you, this stunt where we strap cameras right there, bam, that looked like it hurt. You a holes are in trouble now. Gentlemen, I want to introduce you to my friend, Optimus Prime. Taking the children was a bad move. Autobots? The scene where we pull the guns out. Look at the driver in the car with John Turturro. We had a little jazz here. He uses his magnetic gun right there. If you freeze it, watch the gun. Watch the guns fly up past the guys. When you, when, I want you to go back in that DVD and freeze it. Because I told the driver, I said, no, you will not get hurt. They're rubber guns, and they're on bungee cords, and they're going to pull. Well, if you freeze it, you'll see it hit him kind of in the temple. <laughs> he goes, I thought you said it wasn't going to hurt. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> there are, that's seven protocols. Okay? I'm not authorized to communicate with you, except to tell you I can't communicate with you. Get out of the car. Me. I don't know, I was kind of crazy when I told the writers, I said, you know, I really want to have Bumblebee piss on John Turturro. Um, you know, call me crazy, but you know what, at least the audience has left. How you doing? You weren't supposed to hear all that. Yeah. This is real. You know, doing Transformers, I gotta tell you, a bunch of, bunch of adults running around the set the first couple days and saying the word Bumblebee and Megatron, and I remember the first couple days, literally about... 50, 50 airmen, um, military extras at the uh, Holloman Air Force Base. And I said, I know, guys, this sounds really stupid, but you're going to have this big robot fly in, go and transform land right here. And the guys were in their 20s, 30s. They go, uh, would that be Starscream? <laughs> I'm like, you know, it was... I honestly did not think there were that many fans around the world for this thing. And how much it meant to people that are now in their 30s and you know it, it just it just i you know being told but but seeing it in your life is a different thing but but just for hasbro to say uh you know this is the largest selling toy around the world and the top it's a top five largest selling toy around the world for 20 years um i think that's a big accomplishment but i just didn't realize the depth of of how many fans there were around the world and um you know right now uh you, you just kind of as we were getting ready to release the movie, and the, and the, 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 the trailers were always like on Yahoo, like the number one downloaded, uh, most watched, and consistently from when they came out Christmas to almost the day of the release. Like pirates would come up there, and then it would fall back down. But we were always one and two for the entire time, and that kind of told me something. It actually became one of the most downloaded trailers uh, in, in, in history, according to Yahoo, that tracks this stuff. Um, um, so all those kind of signs were telling me something. And then when it opened, and it became the largest non-sequel opening of all time which uh, you know I, I guess I was a 
I, I just honestly did not think it could do as well as it's done so far. I mean, it's going to pass 300 plus million here, and, uh, uh, you know, that's right up there with the Spider Man and uh, Pirates 3, these gigantic franchises. And, um, you know, internationally, it's going to. Right now, we're already at 260 something. It'll probably go to 350, 400. I don't know. But, um, anyway, I guess it was a good gamble for the studio on this. A lot of people would have done that helicopter shot right there, um, digitally, but uh, not me for some reason. Uh, that was a real helicopter, very close to that bus. I just like things real. As much real as I can get, I'm going to do, and uh, um, it seems to be like a dying art with a lot of directors now where you do your own stunts. You do a lot of stunts and stuff like that. Doing these gigantic moves on this special Aquila crane, which is like 75 feet tall, we're able to do these big drops. So it's kind of a chaotic scene because we had four helicopters, one airship, and uh, um, uh, it was quite noisy in this uh, river of, I don't know if that's, I don't know what's in that river, that polluted river right there. We actually saved a guy's life uh, in the river that night. We just so happened to be there when a guy in a hospital uniform was floating by, and literally there's no getting out of that thing because that channel travels very quickly and it's all algae and there's no stopping. It goes all the way to the ocean. It was, so some one of our electricians just threw out a piece of cable and saved this guy. It was like an escapee from some hospital. Take your shot, Rip. Get it. Take the shot. No! I've never worked on a movie where obviously I've had to do so much digital animation of character animation. Um, uh, it was really one of the most fascinating things about this movie is, is, is actually directing these kind of creatures and, and, and ultimately making them feel like you've got a soul inside of them uh, when you see these things. And I think it's done through sound and facial stuff. You know, you just start to feel for this thing that doesn't even exist. I think that's kind of the accomplishment of the movie. Right there, uh, right there, that, that's the mock-up of Bumblebee we actually built for 200 grand. Really complicated build. It wasn't, you couldn't really shoot it that closely. Uh, like you can see right there, that's the mock-up, which saves money on digital shots. And then there again, you see the mock-up. And then we go back to digital shot. So if you use it sparingly right there, the f five, six, seven shots with that mock-up just saved a lot of money. We only had mock-up pieces of like Optimus Prime and uh, certain head sections, but... Uh, Nothing that detailed. We built Megatron's legs in the in the in the chamber where he's being held. We built about 30 feet of his legs, which cost us half a million dollars. But when we use it through those shots, it actually saves you on effect shots um, because every one of those pieces. The reason why it's so expensive, you got to carve it out of foam, and then you know it's got to be on a steel like, kind of frame to hold it up. And this shot right here, I, I call it the Jungle Gym Optimus. I just hated the blocking of it, but we were kind of stuck with the shot that we, we shot and. Oftentimes the animators had to squeeze in where we can fit our robots. Um, we got to be very good at shooting robots after a while, and we used a special tool. Um, uh, it's a Porsche Cayenne with a special crane on it where we're able to um, a move at a high rate of speed on a car, and we can do these amazing crane moves. So it was actually like our robot cam um, where we can spin around. And right there, walking through National Military Command, that was a room that I've been to. It's the basement of the Pentagon. That's where they run wars and whatnot. And uh, the thing that I always remember was they going down there, they have these two lucite doors that are like bulletproof and you can you know blast proof, and uh, you have to go through these doors. And um, the chamber that we take this this uh, um, this conversation that comes up is called the vault in the. Uh, in the Pentagon, actually, it's a soundproof room that has this vault door, and it has five seats um, for the Secretary of Defense and 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 the the two the four different branches of military, and with a direct link to the President. Um, they feel that this room is like the fewer people that know about what's going on, the better a secret can be kept. So um, we kind of designed it exactly the way I saw the room, uh, was from my memory, I guess, when I was down in the Pentagon. They actually took me into the room where the two guys are there to launch nuclear weapons. They sit in their own vault. It's kind of an odd uh, experience. I was down in the Pentagon when I was doing uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, the, the tap dance. Um, I met with every branch of the military because of the cooperation we needed. Um, you know, actually Transformers, since Black Hawk Down and Pearl Harbor, 
This has been the largest military cooperation that they've done thus far since those two movies. It wasn't. Legal 2 transmitted 13 seconds. This was classified above top secret. This is actually the very first stuff we ever shot for Transformers right here, with the Mars rover here. It was part of our teaser. I've always been fascinated what if the Mars rover found something that was of human origin. So, something I always save for a movie. It's a pile of Martian rocks. This is the image from Mars. Here's the image your special ops team was able to retrieve from the base attack. We believe they're of the same exoskeletal type, and obviously not Russian or North Korean. Are we talking about an invasion? We intercepted the message from your special ops team. These things can be hurt by our weapons, and now they know it. That's why the virus shut us down, so we can't coordinate against their next attack which I would bet my ridiculous government salary is coming soon. Get word to our fleet commanders over the National Guard frequency. It's a shortwave radio channel. It might be still working. Tell them to turn their ships around and come home ASAP. And inform all commands to prepare for imminent attack. Josh Demel is someone I, I met in one of my Platinum Dunes meetings uh, for a movie, and uh, I just liked his energy. He just was a great guy, and... Uh, uh, he's got those movie star looks, and um, just thought he would be a good fit in this movie. John Voight's one of the elder statesmen. He's just, uh, actors love hanging around him. He's a really fun guy. He's just uh, such a good actor. Um, and it was nice to see all these young actors around him, and, uh, um, you know, he's really such a leader among these actors. Steven wanted me to cast this movie where it wasn't using movie stars. Um like he would do a lot of his movies. and Because, you know, the movie was a star. The kind of Transformers were the star. Um, you know, I think right now you've got this Shia LaBeouf who is just going you know, to explode off the screen. He's just, uh, you know, an Indiana Jones. And, um, you know, the guy is, uh, you know, he's like he's like the young Tom Hanks. It's uh, uh, He's just one of those kids that really exp has exploded off the screen. And um, I'm proud to have worked with him. And... Uh, it's been a lot of fun to work with, actually. Great energy. Please, let this work. Fire it up, Optimus. The code. The code on these glasses indicates the AllSpark is 230 miles from here. I sense the Decepticons are getting ready to mobilize. They must know it's here as well. What about Bumblebee? We can't just leave him to die and become some human experiment. He'll die in vain if we don't accomplish our mission. Bumblebee is a brave soldier. This is what he would want. Why? This is the uh, the Los Angeles Observatory, and um, it's been under renovation for five years. And you know, uh, California becomes a very tough place to shoot, um, where they, they 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 don't they just make it tough to shoot, and that's been closed. And I, and you know, when you have a big movie, you have a lot more clout. And so going to City Hall. Um, and convincing them that, you know, we're bringing this gigantic movie here and we're keeping it here in, in America and in California where things are running away, moving out of state. Um, and, like, we, we demanded certain things, like to shoot at this observatory. Um, I think the only way I got into this observatory from what I heard, because it's run by this doctor, he knows uh, someone who's married to uh, married into my family called Leonard Nimoy, you know, Spock, who's a big giver of the... Uh, Susan Bay and Leonard Nimoy are big givers to the observatory. <laughs> right here, this is the, the Hoover Dam. And that, that's the actual wall. They don't touch it because it's kind of a, a landmark, obviously, and they don't put rails around it and whatnot. And um, they told me I wasn't allowed to do anything that exploded by it because they're worried about a terrorist blowing up the, the, the dam. Now, let me tell you something. I don't think, I think you need a nuclear bomb to blow that thing up because it's seven football fields thick of concrete. It was made in three years. It was a constant pour. Actually, it was made in four, I think four years. Um, it had a constant pour uh, where they poured one piece of concrete for f four years. When I did this movie, I mean, certain people in California look at this movie like, well, what, is this director stupid? Because it, they go from Nevada all the way to Los Angeles. How do they go so fast? Well, ultimately, most people don't know where this dam is, uh, which is in Nevada. Um, half of it's in Nevada, half is in Arizona, by the way. Um, and I tried to shoot Los Angeles, not as Los Angeles, but, but any town, USA. Uh, that shot you just saw there, that, that, that crane shot by the, by the, the, the dam... We had to keep our, our crane very low because of possible arcing where, where, where it would arc from the gigantic power lines onto the crane. Um, just because if metal's too close to these power lines, it could jump and kill my crew members. So, <laughs> so very uh, scary, I must say. 
This we shot down at the Spruce Goose, where we built this entire set. We did some digital extensions here. Um, we in, we used some of the actual Spruce Goose walls. Um, it just gave me a lot more production value. And right now, you, you see, and that's all real. That's all, everything there is built. Those feet are real. Um, uh, it even says Bay Foundry right there on that little plaque right there, if you zoom in. My grandfather actually helped build that platform. No, I'm kidding. Um, my grandfather was in the stonewashing business. Like, you need to know that. He actually never thought I would make it in the film industry and always thought I would be stonewashing jeans, so thank God I wasn't doing that. NVE-1. That's what we call it. And you didn't think the United States military might need to know that you're keeping a hostile alien robot frozen in the basement? Until these events, we had no credible threat to national security. Well, you got one now. So why Earth? Right here, is, that was a real structure as well. We built part of the hands. Cube looking thing. Anyway, Mr. NVE-1 here, a.k.a. Megatron, that's what they call him, it's pretty much the harbinger of death, wants to use the cube to transform human technology to take over the universe. That's their plan. We walk into this, ne this next scene. I had a very funny speech for John Turturro. He actually, John, kind of sparked off something I said, and he made up this very funny speech, which is in kind of the added uh, extras, extra scenes. About to see our crown jewel. Right here, that was an all digital shot. For some reason, I just wanted pictures of the first seven. I don't know what it means. I think these are the guys that helped discover this cube long before, and then they built the dam over this cube. NB1. President Hoover had the dam built around it. Four football fields thick of concrete, a perfect way to hide its energy from being detected by anyone or any alien species on the outside. So when we had to shoot by the F-22 on the ground, it was a totally secured area, and they wouldn't allow Simon Warnock, who was my assistant director, near the plane because he was a foreigner, and I didn't want him near the plane because he's clumsy. And it's a $130 million plane with uh, made out of uh, composite material and whatnot. They wouldn't allow your cell phones near the plane. I don't think they were worried about, I don't know, radio interference or something. I'm not sure. That blackout pilot was actually the helicopter pilot of that very helicopter. And uh, when we, we hired Mustache Man, um, the f guy actually flying it, I said, my God, you look just like Mustache Man, I would imagine him to. And Steven Spielberg called me up and goes, that's exactly how I pictured Mustache Man. So um, we actually had him delay his wedding and his honeymoon so that he, we can come and shoot Transformers and thus make more money for his future babies. So we helped in the cause. <laughs> right, that's Wolverine. That's very funny. Anybody have any mechanical devices, Blackberry key alarm, cell phone? I got a phone. Because originally when we did this scene, I really wanted to have a little iPod, but Steve Jobs wouldn't allow it, so um, we ended up using some, I guess, Nokia phone and whatnot. Uh, on that sign behind John Turturro, it says uh, the last accident happened here 322 days ago, because that meant that 323 days ago someone was killed in that very facility, as you saw the scratches in the wall and whatnot. I actually ended up cutting it out just for time. <laughs> So I think when we do Transformers 2, I think this is the start of something where we can branch off of what can really go on, happen in our world. That is if I'm going to do Transformers 2. Still haven't made the deal yet. And listen, I gambled my fee on this movie. That means I put my kahunas on the line where I gambled my entire fee that this movie would make money. So that's why when I go to Vegas with my friends, I don't gamble. I gamble on $150 million movies. I don't need to be gambling on $20 slot machines or, you know, $5 hands of blackjack. I gamble on big-ass movies. That's what I do. Gentlemen, they know the cube is here. Banachek, what's going on? The NB-1 hangar has lost power and what? the backup generator is just not going to cut it. Do you have an arms room? That was Kenny Bates and Ian Bryce. Kenny Bates is my stunt coordinator who I've worked with since Bad Boys. Um, he's like my older brother. It's kind of like a... He's like the rain man of stunts. Sometimes you gotta can't understand what he's saying, but he's brilliant in his physics and whatnot. He's gonna kill me for saying that, but uh, um, that's the truth. There's so much physics in when you do stunts and what can go wrong and trying to predict what can go wrong. Um, you know, that's why we've had such an amazing safety record together. Because <sighs> we do very dangerous stuff, but uh, we're, we're we've just been incredibly safe about it. 40 millimeter sable rounds on that table! Here, 
You gotta take me to my car. You have to take me to my car. He's gonna know what to do with the cube. Your car? It's confiscated. It's unconfiscated. We do not know what'll happen if we let him near this thing. You don't Nobody know. Maybe you know, but I don't know. You just wanna sit here and wait and see what happens? No, no. I have people's lives at stake here, young man. Take him to the car. Oh. Drop it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Drop your weapon, soldier. There's an alien war going on and you're gonna shoot me? No, we didn't ask to be here. I'm ordering you under S7 executive jurisdiction. S7 don't exist. Right, we don't take orders from people that don't exist. I'm gonna count to five. I'm gonna count to three. Hmm? Simmons? Yes, sir? I do what he says. Losing's really not an option for these guys. All right. Okay. Hey, you wanna lay the fate of the world on the kid's Camaro? That's cool. You okay? <laughs> they hurt you, right? <laughs> Listen to me. The cube is here. The Decepticons are coming. <laughs> no, no, don't worry about them. They're okay, right? They're not gonna hurt you. Just back up a little bit. He's friendly. He's fine. Okay, come on. Put the guns down. They're not gonna hurt you. Hey, Come, we're gonna take you to the Allspark. Steve Jabulski did our music. Um, he's Hans Zimmer's protege. Hans helped a little on the movie as well. It was uh, very hard to get that theme, that heroic theme I wanted for Transformers. And just one day, I just, I said, Steve, that's a theme. I, just, I played it for Steve, and Steven goes, I love that. It's very memorable, because it's just kind of like, it sounds like a Western. You know, it's just got that great, tragic kind of hero, which I liked. It's just, it's so powerful how to get the right m mood to, to, through music. That's why I really feel sound on movies, like, 50% of a movie. What you try to do with music is you try to set up different themes. You've got the heroic theme for the Optimus. You've got Sam's theme, which is kind of uh, um, by the lake. Uh, you've got um, you've got the Decepticon theme, which is kind of... We found this... that There's a, there's a church choir in London that's it's just got this very dark-sounding church that they record in, and uh, we gave them kind of operatic kind of words that they were saying and it was just this chilling kind of uh decepticon music you saw that camaro transform right there that was the officially the lamest shot of the entire movie uh, that's why we cut it down um you always have turkey shots and that was let me tell you a turkey i'm gonna tell you another shot when we get there uh steven actually wanted to pay for it uh it's where optimus is nose unfolds and you see his face and after after he slides around the Camaro. I had never ended up putting it in the movie. I left it off. I am Megatron. I hear that thing flying. I didn't like that thing flying. It was, uh, it flew a little farther than I wanted for comfort. So we had stuntmen down below and but no one was hurt. Cube's okay? Yeah, it's fine. Put the seatbelt on. That one sound when you see Starscream on the on the top of that dam and he's vibrating, that's my favorite sound in the entire movie when you hear his body kind of shudder right there. The humans have taken it. What I'm going to do in Transformers 2 is I'm going to focus more on the faces. Um, I guess because of the limited number of effect shots, I limited myself on how close I went into these faces so that I can, I guess, do more with less. Come to me, Mentor. Come to me. We're hot. We're live. Where are the mics? Mics? This no, doesn't work no, without no, mics, Simmons. No, 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 no! This is called our alien archive room uh, that I thought was fun. It's got, it's got books going 40 feet tall up into the kind of stacks. This holds all the Sector 7 stuff that's been there through history of anything alien having to do with uh, our world here. Okay, let's see. Uh, that's a Simmons! I need a screwdriver! Here's Optimus. That shot where we're, we're tracking behind Optimus, I'm actually in the Porsche Cayenne. We're going 55 miles an hour as an entire semi locks up, and we're right behind. I mean, I gotta tell you, that's a little scary. Um, we shot that scene where they're driving in the Valley of Fire. Um, we actually blew a roadblock because the sun was going down, and uh, which means we passed a cop roadblock, and we kept shooting on this road, and uh, 
they were so pissed. They hauled uh, Ian Bryce, my producer, and he had to kiss a bunch of hands and in Vegas, uh, uh, or they were going to shut us down at the Hoover Dam. So thank God to Ian. But I had to get the shot, and you know what? I'll run any police roadblock I have to if the sun's going down and I got a beautiful shot. See, I'm never really good at taking no for an answer, so uh, <laughs> I don't know. Whoops, I didn't see it, sorry. Secretary Keller, uh-huh. Yeah. North Com Commander. Whoa! Whoa! What was that? Authenticating emergency action. Blackbird 1195. Sir, I have an authenticated airstrike order from SecDef. They're doing this, uh, this highway scene. Uh, we shot it on a freeway uh, near Riverside. Um, I've done a lot of car stuff in my, my day. We've done, we did this in two days. We're actually launching cars off a, off a car carrier. They're, they're, they're dropping onto the ground, and the Bay Buster is actually ramming into these cars. It's a special thing that I built on Bad Boys 2. Go see that disc, and then you'll learn all about it. So on this freeway, you can see all those people standing up there. They heard that Transformers were shooting uh, in the neighborhood, so those are real fans actually watching us shoot. Right here, this is done with a special go-kart, and then we transition to the Porsche Cayenne camera, and we tilt down, and we pull away. Um, that's done two different moves, and we, we seamlessly blend it in together. So I wanted Bone Crusher right here as he slaps through. I wanted him to be look like a hockey player. Um, so I had them right here. This looks like a hockey player, and then we go to a football tackle right there. That was my favorite shot in the whole movie right there. This was over a freeway uh, that I had the big and move a crane where we kind of blocked this doing plates and whatnot. Um, what I realized in the animation is, is the animators are not fight choreographers, which fight choreographers have been working 20 years and they've been doing this. So they, they spent forever on this stuff right here that you're seeing right now, and they were never getting it right. So what we did is once I got these plates, these shots, I actually used real fighters that had different abilities, different fighting skills, and I would videotape them by like a pole or whatnot. I would kind of imitate these angles. And we actually had humans kind of fighting this out at the same beat, at the, at the same time as these plates. Um, and it wasn't motion capture, but it was just, they were able to copy what these fighters were doing in the time they were doing it. So that became a very effective way for us to work. The voice of this little frenzy guy, he's just got this most amazing human voice that we were able to overlay some uh, mechanical sounds over it. It's amazing that a human can actually talk like this, but it makes it quite funny. If you listen really closely, he's saying the word Tutankhamun. He keeps saying Tutankhamun, I don't know, it just can be a funny thing, you can listen to it. Here we are at Edwards uh, Air Force Base, where they're actually going into real F-22s, unlike Die Hard, where they had to use fake F-22s, because, I don't know, they just don't have the juice. But we got real, real stuff. That's because I got the phone number to the Pentagon. Oh, let's go! Lana! Yeah, I got shortwave radios. Wait, what, what am I supposed to do with these? Well, use them! That's all we got! This is like Radio Shack dinosaur radios or something, man. I'm only gonna get 20... Doing this downtown stuff, I gotta tell you, is one of the harder things that I've done in terms of keeping all these different storylines going simultaneously. Um, and unfortunately, what made it harder for me is I was not able to shoot on one block consecutively. I, I literally had to be shoved around L.A. to different blocks, and so I had to use basically three different blocks, one in Detroit, two in L.A., and well, actually four, one on the Universal back lot, and kind of blend them all together as, as if they're one. So some of the geography shots I don't really have because I was just never able to do it because it's just uh, it's they were different blocks and it would give things away. So it made it very tough uh, on me to figure out some of this stuff. Uh, but one of the helps was we had to shoot on the weekends, so I was able to assemble what we were shooting so I can kind of keep track of everything. Uh, you know, it's just a uh, it's really hard when you've got when you've got multiple stories going going on. Um, and especially this is a this is like a 25 minute ending action scene. This is one of my favorite moments here. This was right, shot on the Universal back lot. This shot um, with a real truck. We kind of moved it on cue, uh, right there. We kind of shake it as I'm counting it out. Then Shia is coming. To, we kind of walk it out for Shia. How how fast Bumblebee will be moving. Um, and it's just beautiful animation right here. And how he's straining right there. See that arm going down and the head shaking right here. I kept trying to say is. You know, you can really get into the fine detail with these animators. That was Universal Backlot right here, and then the shot with Josh in the close-up, that was uh, downtown. So it's just... It's just you gotta remember exactly what piece you shot and that you need in another place. Black Hawk inbound, your location over. Ow, 
Alpha 273 degrees, 10 miles. November Victor, 1.2 clicks north. So that's Universal Backlot right there. And again, Universal Backlot. DreamWorks kept ha having meetings on the Universal Backlot. They kept hearing explosions. Now we come down to downtown. Um, and now on the backlot. You see how you can go back and forth, back and forth, and uh, it, you really can't tell. That's the backlot, and now we're downtown. I'm not going to leave you. Coming up here, these are some of my favorite shots right here. This just takes it to a whole new level. I wanted these robots not to be what I called clunky, fat, effing robots. That was the that was a lingo on the animator's desk. So we looked at a lot of ninja movies, karate movies, samurai, things like Gladiator. Um, we just wanted them to be warriors that can jump and spin. And... If you look at at this scene right here coming up where he's shooting, there's going to be something right here on the roof, right there. It says Takara Sushi. There's actually a whole bunch of things. If you actually pause it at certain cars, random cars, you'll see things on license plates. You'll see, uh, like, Easter eggs all over this movie. You'll see different shop signs that say certain things. Uh, you'll even see my address to my house on one of these things. I'm not telling you where it is. <laughs> Got the tail number to my plane. It's 4,500 x-ray. <laughs> We need a tail number, so why not use mine? It sounds good, too. Statues on top, go to the roof. Set the flare. No. Signal the chopper. And set the oh, flare. I can't say, listen to me, you're a soldier now. All right, I need you to take this cube, get it into military hands while we hold them off. There are a lot of people are gonna die. You gotta go, you gotta go. No, you, I'm not, you need to go. No, I'm not gonna get, get Bumblebee out of here, okay? You know, you always want to redo things in movies, and that prop of the cube, it's kind of lame. You know, it's just. It's just not what it should be. You know, but you can't catch everything because you got so many millions of parts moving on. I, I, you know, those Blackhawks that are flying through downtown, no what happens, it was the only time in my life I've wanted a religious service to end quickly because uh, we were not allowed to fly them close to, to uh, downtown why this religious service was going on, right where Shia's running towards. He's even offering, thinking of offering them donations so that we could keep continuing shooting, but they didn't want to buy that. Ah. Watch out! <laughs> You know, when you watch this movie, right here when you see this, you're actually rooting for a truck. I mean, isn't that silly? But it works. And this we did this digitally with the Porsche Cayenne coming around, kind of like that shot that I did on uh, Bad Boys where I spun around the guys and I've done it subsequently in The Rock and Armageddon. And uh, why not do it with Optimus Prime here? Now, Megatron was not a big gun because I just didn't know how I would explain him being a big gun. Just doesn't make sense. Shooting that hotel thing, we shot it with a little tiny little helicopter, a little, uh, like, with a, like a, it's a lawnmower engine. It can take a tiny little, uh, camera up and, uh, it's two guys with remote controls control it. I got a lot of flack for the face of Megatron. He was a little uglier than he is now. Um, and the fans, rightly so, uh, complained about it, and we kind of fixed the face. I think he's pretty cool. Um, he looks menacing. 
This was done down in Detroit and then smashing into a real set here with the stuntman diving out. But shooting the deli shot, it was very complicated because we had to shoot it against blue screen. We had to rip up the car violently and we had to throw it once it ripped up into the window. So we shoot it first with people inside the deli. Then we have Shia run past the, the deli window several times. Then we rip up the car and, and we kind of pull it into the window right here. And then we kind of marry them all together to make it look very dangerous. This shot with Starscream landing, those are real cars that are getting flipped violently. Um, simultaneously, they're being pulled by giant cranes on these kind of canister rigs that are just extremely violent when they pull things. So imagine no robots there and just kind of figuring out timing of like how long that plane's supposed to transform to it flying out. I mean, you really, as you're operating camera, uh, it's a little bit of guesswork and trying to fit it in. There's Ron. You just saw him there, the African-American sitting in the chair. He was, uh, believe it or not, Ron is homeless and uh, a very intelligent homeless man. And he doesn't, we offer him money, he doesn't want it, but he is a huge fan of movies. And what he does, he knows everything about the film industry. He knows so many people in the business. And he literally becomes a mascot of the set. He followed us wherever we went. He actually rented a car or hitched away, got a bus ticket, and he made it to Detroit. And we were all surprised to see him there and we I, I told Ian we got to get him a hotel room and uh, he didn't want it but we forced him to take it um, but uh, you know Ron's gonna be on my movies from now on uh, he's a great guy that was the train station down in Detroit it's now gonna be I think destroyed so this is the last movie to be shot there So we're doing this scene with uh, these gigantic uh, metal prongs that are off the tow truck and we're actually backing up that tow truck and uh, the driver is Corey who's dressed as a girl. Um, he's got a little cute pink top on, it look, he looks frightening as a girl. And that shot where we're flipping the cars up, we have come by these car flippers and it gets as close as possible and then we trigger the car flippers as the car comes up. is definitely dead now. All right, let's go, we got business. Now this scene where we did downtown on this rooftop, it's about 20 stories tall. Shia is escaping from Megatron and he climbs on one of these statues and uh, Ian Bryce, my producer, goes, uh, well, you can do this blue screen, right? I said, no, I want to do it as real as possible. Let's do it real. Let's hang Shia out there on this, uh, let's hang him by a wire. This is a Blackhawk actually hovering right over a, an LA building. It's kind of an interesting sight having Blackhawks flying through Los Angeles. Such low altitude. Right there, that's a real tail of a helicopter mock-up that comes past Shia. Um, you know, it's safe because Shia's ducking down, but that thing is actually busting kind of plaster concrete and whatnot. But those are the type of shots that I like to involve the actor in. So it just gives more intensity and realism to the scene. No. I said to Shia, I said, Shia, I'm going to hang you out on this building, and, uh, you know, there's not a lot of foot room up there, but you're safe with wires. And he says, okay, all right, I'm cool. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. Well, literally the moment before he was supposed to go up and get on this very secured statue and totally safe wire, even though you can't see it, it's it's on either side of his hip, uh, he goes, Mike, come here, come here. I, I, I can't do this. I said, are you, are you kidding me, Shia? You're going to embarrass yourself in front of all, the whole crew. Now, mind you, I would never, in my own mind, I would never go out there. But I'm a director, so I can tell people to do things like that. With all the machismo and whatnot, I'm like, dude, you're going to go out there and you're going to like it. You get paid way more money than those kids on Fair Factor. So get the hell out there. So, of course he did it. It was an awesome shot, because it's totally real. And three minutes into doing it, Shia just loved it. Hold on to the cube. I was actually supposed to be hanging out of a Mercedes grabbed by Megatron and climb out of the sunroof, which I did. And they... They had me wired by a cable where they pulled my ankle up and he was supposed to yank me. But in light of not doing that shot, I was the guy that got flicked by Megatron and, and goes into the cab. So that is me. 
Zan. You risked your life to protect the cube. No sacrifice. No victory. If I cannot defeat Megatron, you must push the cube into my chest. I will sacrifice myself to destroy it. Get behind me. It's you and me, Megatron. No, it's just me, Prime. At the end of this day, one shall stand, one shall fall. You still fight for the weak. That is why you lose. That's in 60 seconds. We got friendlies mixed with bad guys. Targets will be marked. Bring the rain. Let's kill these things. Move, move, move. Remember, aim low. Armor's weak out of the chest. <laughs> target marked. Still waiting. Down on target. 20 seconds. F-22s will still wait. Mama! shots basically i'm having my helicopter pilot fly uh with a uh this division which is a much wider negative larger so you can move it around a bit and he's flying as fast as he can go through these buildings and around um it's kind of very much how we did some of our pearl harbor stuff um and i had had actually some of the same uh plane animators that worked on pearl uh work on this when i went to test screen this movie with the studio we did it in Arizona, and we were doing a family theater where it was a bunch of kids, like at 5 o'clock with parents, and then we were going to do an adult uh, screening with adults about 8 o'clock, and they were both 500 person houses, so they're very large. What I do when I put my movies together is I actually will put like a small group in a screening room, different age kids, where they'll watch a very rough cut, give me some ideas. It's very good to have to show your movie up on a bigger screen so you can see it and, and, and put it in front of people. You can see where they get confused, what they're liking, what's not working. So I did that twice. With uh, First started with 9 year olds to 16 and then I went from 16 to 25 year olds. And it prepared me for, I guess, my studio screening. Even being a Final Cut director, it's still intense because they come there with 30 people from Paramount and DreamWorks. Everyone is nervous. They make the, the they determine what they're going to spend on advertising. That very moment, you get numbers. So we watched it with the families. It went well. They were laughing at the different jokes. They were not laughing at some of the adult jokes. There were several applause through the screening, and I'm like, huh, that's kind of fun but odd that they're they're applauding like three or four times during the screening. Then I I quickly ran over to the adult theater. So I saw the adult one start up. Then I ran back to the kids one where we did a focus group, 26 people. This guy stands up saying, I have nothing to do with this movie. How would you rate this movie? Excellent, blah, blah, blah. Very good. Poor, good, whatever. Um, so all 26 hands raised, excellent. And I'm like, huh, well, okay, it's a fluke. It's a family thing, whatever. Then I ran back to the adult screening, and I sat next to this guy, and I was just sitting in some random aisle seat where I had a little sound box where I got to control the volume because the volume is, is not really precise because it's not fully mixed sound, and it's a little abrasive at times. And the guy knew I was a director because I told him, because he, he asked what that box was. And halfway through the movie, the people are really enjoying it. You can see the adults are laughing. And I asked this, this guy who's about 30, I said, so, like, does this movie, like, um, do you like this kind of movie? And he looked at me and goes, eh, not really my thing. Eh, not really. So I'm thinking, this movie sucks. All right, it's just going to be a kid's movie. All right, fine, it'll be a kid's movie. Every emotion goes through your body when you're a director sitting there watching 
500 people at a time see your movie. And um, they don't care who you are, what you are, nothing. They just, they'll, they'll tell you. They'll be frank as, 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 it's just, it can be a brutalizing experience because they will tell you how bad or good your movie is. Then we did a focus group with the adults. And we had a huge round of applause at the end of the movie. And I'm like, wow, that's kind of odd. These are adults. This is a robot movie. What are they, what are they applauding for? All right, I thought this is a kid's movie. So we go to this uh, focus group, and this woman who was, I got to tell you, she was like 40. And she says, oh, this is after they raised their hands, which, which out of 26 people, 24 of them raised it excellent and two very good. And I'm thinking, well, that's kind of odd because that just never happens. I mean, those are, that's, it's like, it's a lot of people saying excellent. Um, uh, and this woman raised her hand. She says, I was dragged to this movie. I didn't want to see this movie. And, um... She goes, but you know what, this movie, it reinvents the superheroes. It, it, it kind of, she goes, I'm tired of the capes and the suits and all that stuff, and this totally is something new and different that I've never seen before. And that's when it kind of hit me. And then we got the numbers for the kids' audience, which was a 94, which is, that's a huge score. I've never had that score in my life. I mean, those are, that's, that's a massive number. And then we got the adult score. It was the exact same, 94. So obviously the studio is, is doing cartwheels, and um, I guess it was a good experience uh, as far as movie testing goes. The parents here were, were something that the audience, they all felt what happened to them. So this is an additional scene I, I shot just to uh, let people in what, what, what happened to them and that they're keeping this conspiracy going. Likewise, uh, they also want to know what happened to Starscream, so I added it again where I see him go back into space. What they told me in that test was I had to fix this ending. And a lot of times if they don't like the ending in audience, they'll actually be harder on the grading of the movie. But somehow there was so much goodwill to this movie that they, they, they you know, um, they still gave it a very, very high score, and uh, I had to f fix some issues with the cube. Um, I had to show, it was very kind of vague for them to understand what Sam had to do by pushing the cube into his chest. So we had to do something by the observatory with Optimus showing the spark, and uh, talking about he'll, he'll put it into his own chest. Um, and then we had to do a few more shots with Sam pushing it into Megatron's chest, just to clarify the, the ending. It's just, it's been a bizarre experience traveling with this movie to so many different countries, and even Japan, where I just saw a screening of 4,500 people. In Japan, it's funny, they'll tell you, oh, the movie's so funny, it's so funny, but, like, you watch it, and you, you want to kill yourself, because you got 4,500 people sitting there, not emoting at all, because it's unpolite to laugh in Japan when you're watching a movie. Uh, but then they gave it a huge applause at the end, which is something that they don't do as well, and uh, the Japanese uh, theater people that, that are distributors there, they were just saying, that's, that's a very good sign. So it opens in Japan, I guess, when you get this DVD, it will have already opened in Japan, but uh, I'm, I'm, this is a, a week before it opens. Um, but it, it's just, in the Asian countries, it's just, uh, it's been phenomenal. I mean, Korea, it's the number one movie of all time, uh, at 50 million something. Uh, Malaysia, it's the number one movie of all time. It's the biggest opening in China of all time. Um, uh, it's just crazy. Transformers was the most fun experience I had directing a movie. It was definitely challenging, but a lot of my movies have been challenging. I just, it was a new experience, experience for me in that, that working almost like on an animation movie with live action. Um, I can't wait to get started on two. The, the experience... Uh, of it coming out and the way it's been accepted around the world has just been staggering to me. The fans have, have uh, the death threat stopped. I'm very glad, you know. Um, I think I've made a lot of the fans very happy. I mean, I know I have. I mean, uh, they've told me and um, um, so many have said that thanks for making my childhood dreams come true. It's like they've all dreamed of this movie. Um, so that's a really nice feeling and it's a uh, but it's even a nicer feeling to, to, to see older people that have knew nothing of Transformers to actually really enjoy this movie. And um, I'm just proud to have worked with the people I worked with, and I uh, can't wait to do it again. Um, it was a d delight to work with the writers, and uh, uh, Kurtzman and Orsi, I just, I don't know if they're going to write too, because they, they don't know if there's any magic left. Uh, they've got to be wrong with that, you know? So, I'm... Um, about to hear many many pitches but I know that Transformers 2 if I do it I definitely want to take it to a whole other visual level um, you know I think this movie has definitely raised the bar of, of visual effects uh, in terms of realistic visual effects and what can be done it's almost anything what a director thinks can be done nowadays um, it's amazing how effects jump every single year and uh, you know so I look forward to doing it again so thanks for listening to me 
Yeah, some of it I hope I'm not blabbing, but uh, <laughs> it's hard to sit in a dark room right here with a microphone in front of you and talk for three hours. Till next time. See you.